Well, welcome to the King's India Institute and to the third Dr. Escopal Memorial Lecture. Um, at the King's India Institute, we aim to bring our research on contemporary India into the public domain and to engage with issues of the day through our research. And as we do so, we, we draw inspiration from a tradition of public intellectuals in India who themselves combined in exemplary ways rigorous research and active public engagement. And as our own small homage to that tradition, we've established a series of annual lectures to honor the memory of some of the most notable exponents of that tradition. So we've set up the MN Srinivas Memorial Lecture, the third of which was delivered earlier this year by Professor Arjuna Padurai. And we're also uh, planning to set up a memorial lecture in the field of science and technology policy. Tonight's lecture is the third in memory of one of the foremost historians and liberal minds of modern India, Dr. Sarvapali Gopal. Born on April 23rd in 1926, in a career that stretched almost five decades, he established himself as an outstanding historical biographer and a, a political historian, as well as an editor of major editions of archival sources, and also as a public intellectual who moved in corridors of power and published in the popular press. His three-volume biography of Nehru remains a landmark. Uh, and his edition of Nehru's selected works, which he began, is one of the most important published sources for modern India's history. He also played an important role in establishing historical scholarship in India through the department at JNU. And we've been lucky to have, um, as our first two Dr. Escopal lecturers, both his most distinguished pupil, Professor Sir Christopher Bailey, and last year, we had his most distinguished contemporary and colleague, Professor Ramla Thapar. Unusually, though, Gopal was not just an academic historian. He also had a career in government. He helped to create the historical division within the Ministry of External Affairs, and he directed that division's activities for over a decade. And in his capacity as director of the historical division, division Dr. Gopal was closely involved in the development of critical briefs used in discussions with the Chinese over boundary, the boundary dispute. Uh, and he also, uh, in his years at the ministry, oversaw a number of important publications uh, that were used to shape government policy. And it's this aspect of Dr. Gopal's career at the Ministry of External Affairs, and in particular his critical role in shaping Indian perceptions concerning China, both before and after the 1962 war, that's the focus of this evening, and that provides the connection to this evening's distinguished lecturer. I'm really delighted to welcome, as our third Dr. Gopal Memorial Lecturer, India's, one of India's most distinguished diplomats, Ambassador Nirupma Rao. From her early career, um, from early in her career at the MEA, Nirupma Rao developed expertise on China, mastering the language and culture of that great civilization. And she accompanied Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi on his historic visit to China in 1988, the first by an Indian Prime Minister since the 1962 conflict. After serving as India's envoy in, in South American countries and then in Sri Lanka, she went on to become India's, she, she, went, she was then Deputy Chief of the Moscow Embassy, Foreign Ministry Spokesperson, and then went on to become India's first woman ambassador to China in 2006. And she then went on to become India's Foreign Secretary, the highest office in the Indian Foreign Service. Stepping down as Foreign Secretary after a tenure of two years, she was appointed as India's ambassador to Washington, D.C. Ambassador Rao is also a published author, and since leaving the Washington Embassy, she's been working on a book on the India-China relationship, drawing on archival research and also on her own personal experience in government managing that relationship. To her insider's view and understanding, she now brings the eye of a historian in what promises to be a really significant contribution to our understanding of India's relations with China. It's a subject of crucial importance but also of great complexity, and it's often surrounded by controversy. 
And this evening, she'll give us a preview of her current research project in a lecture entitled The Politics of History, India and China, 1949 to Thank you, Sunil, for those words of introduction. History, Howard Zinn once said, is an empty vessel, and you can fill it in whatever way you can. My view is that we should have a sense of proportion about history, what is significant and what not so significant. When we study the history of our relations with China in the decade until 1962, the debate often fixes on causation, the contributory and decisive causes leading to our defeat, India's defeat, or humiliation. But of these, what is relevant to the living and not the dead? What does that history teach us about today? How does it connect to us today and how we shape our future? There can be infinite meanings attached to what caused the war between India and China, but what is the purpose for which we seek that meaning or understand the cause of what happened? The purpose of asking this should be to seek answers relevant to us today. What lessons are to be learned about leadership, about public opinion, about logistical and military preparedness, about narrowing differences, and about negotiation? How can we deduce a new history for the future? The historian David Stevenson recently drew our attention, and I'm referring to an article that appeared just a month ago in the Journal of International Affairs. Stevenson draws attention to an interesting anecdote concerning Boswell and Johnson. In that story, we are transported to the rain-soaked, desolate moorland of the Hebrides in which these two eminent persons are traveling. Boswell is peevish, imagining that Macbeth's three witches would emerge from the murky surroundings. Monbodo House, their destination, is a tumble-down, wild and naked place. But the conviviality of their Hebridean host, Lord Monbodo, provides comfort to these tired travelers, and the evening conversation turns to history. Says Monbodo, and I quote, the history of manners is the most valuable. I never set a high value on any other history, unquote. To this, Johnson says, quote, nor I, and therefore I esteem biography as giving us what comes near to ourselves, what we can turn to use, unquote. Boswell, meanwhile, interjects to say, quote, but in the course of general history we find manners. In wars we see the disposition of people, their degrees of humanity, and other particulars, unquote. Johnson is still skeptical, saying yes, but then you must take all the facts to get this, and it is but a little you get. And then Lord Monbodo, the host, has the final say, he says, and it is that little which makes history valuable. History, any history, is about the book of life, as Samuel Eliot Morrison once said. It is a jungle and a jumble of facts and impressions, and the history of the India-China relationship is no exception. Making history valuable, relating it to the book of life is then the challenge, and defining the historian's essential vocation, the even greater one. <laughs> 
how do we extract that little that makes history valuable and relevant to our present and future lives from the passage of relations between two large Asian nations in the last mid-century. The India-China relationship in its early mid-20th century phase is a history of politics, of ideologies, of the disposition of leaders, and a history of war, the study of whose conclusions reminds us that it is we, us, who are exactly mirrored in those events and decisions, for we have not as yet distilled the import of those events. That history has confined us in many ways, and if we are to build a secure future, we must untie our minds about it. I'm indeed honored to deliver the third S. Gopal Memorial Lecture at King's College today. The topic I have chosen elicits more emotion than reason, especially in India. In S. Gopal's own post-1962 writing, there is no personal account of his own role in those crucial years leading up to the war. In the service of the Indian Constitution and his government, he strengthened the policy brief on our border with China. It may, as some have argued, been a maximalist stand, but in consonance with his acknowledged reputation as a good historian, it was impeccably researched, a focused marshalling of fact, and imbued with certitude. It was a task, as Srinath Raghavan puts it, that stood at the intersection between history and foreign policy making, where frontier policy met foreign policy. Under Gopal's stewardship, the historical division of the Ministry of External Affairs, which did the research for the official stalks of 1960 with China, rose, I quote, to the peak of its performance and influence, unquote. The words are Srinath Raghavan's. I never had the privilege of meeting Gopal. In the south block of the 80s and 90s, Gopal's was an invisible but constant presence, hovering over the voluminous records of the 1960 talks between the officials of India and China. There is that Christmas 1960 photograph of the Indian delegation of officials with Prime Minister Nehru, a 37-year-old Gopal directly behind the Prime Minister, smiling and civilized. His contributions on the historical inputs provided on the boundary question with China, as his colleague in the Ministry of External Affairs, Jagat Mehta, who just passed away, noted, I quote, throughout remained crucial, unquote. This required a mastery of fact and argument, and Mehta acknowledged Gopal's indisputable command of his subject. He adds how this scholarship was the progenitor of an academic industry of sorts globally on the Sino-Indian boundary question in the years that followed. Writing in 1961 on the immense document of 555 closely printed pages packed with comment upon comment as Pelion piled on Ossa and Ossa on Olympus which was the report of the officials authored essentially on the Indian side by Gopal, Olaf Caro highlighted the contrasting intellectual approach to a dispute by representatives of what he called the two maturest civilizations in the world, each in the bloom of a renaissance, unquote. The Chinese argument, he said, was shot through with a sly mockery of the Indian evidence, while the Indian argument in Caro's words was marshaled with a lucid clarity and respect for logic worthy of any Oxford cloister. Save perhaps on the grounds of prolixity, a Socrates could hardly fault it, he said. And concluding with a statement that the true boundary of the Indian world is on the crest of the northernmost crinkle of the Himalaya, 
where it overlooks and falls to the Tibetan plateau, Caro noted the lack of common ground in the two reports, Indian and Chinese. China, he said, was seeking to assert a claim never made before to the Indian Olympus. Jagat Mehta, whose own role in the evolution of this history also stands out, spoke in later years of the intellectual pleasure of working with Gopal. When the draft summary of the official's report was shown to Prime Minister Nehru by Mehta and Gopal, the former's recollection runs thus. Sitting next to the original Tang horse presented by Cho and Lai on his visit to India in 1956, in the upstairs sitting room of Teen Murthy House, the prime ministerial residence at that time, Panditji, that is Nehru, took nearly two hours to read it. He asked some questions, but raised no objection. Mehta adds that the credit for refining the punchline of the conclusion goes to Gopal. It summarizes India's case and is worth repeating. Quote, the facts therefore demand respect for this boundary, defined by nature, confirmed by history, and sanctified by the law of nations. The Chinese critique of the Indian arguments contained in the report are well documented. The charge was that these, the Indian arguments, were shot through the prism of imperialism, to use the Chinese words. Gopal disputed this firmly. Here are his words. We hold, as we have again repeatedly stated, no brief for imperialism. In considering the boundary alignment, it is not necessary to consider or analyze the motive of the past, unless, of course, there is definite evidence to prove that it has a bearing on the alignment under consideration. We have always tried to concentrate on the facts and to deal with them objectively, even when they concern the period of British imperialism in India." Unquote. And directing himself towards his Chinese counterpart at the talks, Yang Kung Su, he has these words to say. I am glad that Director Yang agrees with me that not every Englishman is an imperialist. This only proves my point that it is not sufficient to state or to prove a general motivation of British imperialism. What is necessary for our purpose is to show that every particular individual who has been cited has been describing the alignment in a particular manner because he was motivated by imperialist intentions. To rebut our evidence, it would be necessary to prove what the Chinese side said, that every Englishman who confirmed the traditional Indian alignment was therefore an imperialist." Unquote. This is from the discussions held during the official talks. In other words, through that argument, worthy of an Oxford cloister, what Gopal maintained that India's boundary alignment was not an imperialist product. It was naturally, it was a naturally defined boundary, sanctified by tradition and later confirmed by history. In fact, in the description of the idea of India and its frontiers in the note on the historical background of the Himalayan frontiers of India, which can be seen in the Indian government's white papers on the boundary question with China, written in Gopal's perfectly pitched English prose, there is this elegant salvo. India's northern frontier is a traditional one in the sense that it has lain approximately where it now runs for nearly 3,000 years. In this description that then unfolds, the contemporary idea of India finds sanction in the triangulations of India's spiritual, strategic, and civilizational identity. In this same echo chamber, I recall the words of the early 20th century British explorer, Thomas Holditch, speaking before the Royal Geographical Society. He had spent 33 years of his life surveying the Indian frontier describing the Himalayas as the finest combination of boundary and barrier that exists in the world 
Never was such a God-given boundary set to such a vast, impressive, and stupendous frontier. And let me revert to the words in the note by the Ministry of External Affairs in the White Papers, bearing the unmistakable signature of Gopal's style. The Himalayas have always dominated Indian life as they have dominated the Indian landscape. The stirring of the Indian spirit was directed towards those fastnesses. Shiva was the blue-necked, snow-crowned mountain god. Parvati was the spring maiden, daughter of the Himalaya. Ganga was her elder sister. And Meru, Vishnu's mountain, was the pivot of the universe. The Himalayan shrines are still the goal of every Hindu pilgrim. Where does the curtain rise on our contemporary relationship with China? One is aware of the trope upon trope about Jawaharlal Nehru's affair of the head and heart with China. Nehru made his first visit to China in August 1939, a trip that had to be cut short before a planned meeting with Mao Zedong in Yan'an because of the outbreak of World War II in September that year. It is one of the what-ifs of the history of the India-China relationship as to what the trajectory of subsequent events might have been if Nehru had met Mao at that stage. Be that as it may, Indian interest in China was growing significantly. Edgar Snow, writing in 1942, spoke of the broadening of the foundations of Indian nationalism with increasing admiration and esteem being expressed by Indians for the Chinese people in their struggle against Japanese invasion. The Burma-Assam-China frontier, so long a barrier to intercourse, had become a gateway, a center of struggle with Indians now feeling politically and spiritually wedded to China and being aware of the mutual interdependence of their destiny. It is significant also that Nehru's trip to Chongqing, which is the city to which he went, was his first trip to the Far East. Mahatma Gandhi said of this new phenomenon of Indian interest in China, I quote, Jawaharlal Nehru, whose love of China is only excelled, if at all, by his love of his own country, has kept us in intimate touch with the developments of the Chinese struggle. Unquote. Edgar Snow believed of Nehru that China has no more devoted friend alive, and hence neither has the cause of world freedom and brotherhood. India's ambassador to the Chinese nationalists in Nanjing, K.P.S. Menon, told the historian B.R. Nanda of a meeting with Nehru in 1946 when Menon was proceeding to China as India's ambassador to Nanjing. He had so many questions to ask about the Chiang Kai-shek regime. He knew Chiang Kai-shek, who had visited India with his wife in 1942 much to the irritation of Winston Churchill, who did not want the General, General Simo to meet Gandhi and Nehru, quote, and spread the pan-Asian malaise through the bazaars of India, unquote, in his words. To continue with KPS Menon's observations, all the same, Panditji did realize that the Gomintang regime was a corrupt regime, and worse than corrupt, it did not live up to the ideals of Dr. Sun Yat-sen. And Menon goes on to say, I must say, I was amazed at Panditji's intuition and knowledge as to what was happening in China. In fact, he made a rather strange suggestion to me. He said that if I got a chance, I should get in touch with Mao Zedong or Cho Enlai or this group in Yan'an. In the years after 1947, Friendship with China was one of the cornerstones of Nehruvian India's foreign policy. It was only years later that China was to shake Nehru's confidence and, as one writer puts it, mock his own dreams. Let us hear Gopal on this, and I quote, Nehru's policy was founded on friendship with China, but China made clear 
when the time was ripe, that there was no room in her outlook for friendship, and India was obliged to reformulate her policy. The government of India was among the first, second only to Burma, non-communist nations, to recognize the government of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Gopal notes how this was despite the fact that Chinese media mouthpieces describe Nehru as an imperialist quizzling. Nehru was determined to ignore this brusqueness and to befriend China. In Gopal's words, without necessarily agreeing with or supporting China in everything, he refused to line up against her in any way. Suggestions that India should replace China in the UN Security Council were rejected because India, Gopal says, whatever her intrinsic claims to membership, had no wish to secure a seat at China's expense. Unquote. When Chinese armies marched into Tibet in 1950, fragmenting historical geographies and fracturing people-to-people -people contact in the India-China borderlands, the Indian government, while stressing they had no political or territorial ambitions in Tibet, urged that relations between China and Tibet should be adjusted through peaceful negotiations. The Chinese response was accusatory and, in Gopal's words, unwarranted and impertinent. Nehru was realist enough not to be sanguine about these Chinese moves. Administrative steps were taken, for instance, to extend Indian administration in the Northeast Frontier Agency, now Arunachal Pradesh, particularly in the Tamang Tract, and to properly structure and formulate India's relations with Bhutan and Nepal, and to consolidate interests in Sikkim. In Gopal's analysis, in the early years after 1950, as China was consolidating her ascendancy in Tibet, she wished to strengthen her hand by securing India's acceptance of her position. This led to the April 1954 agreement on trade and intercourse between Tibet and India where India gave up all rights that savored of her extraterritoriality and recognized Tibet as a region of China. The five principles of peaceful coexistence were enshrined in the preamble to this agreement. Was it a folly, as many have suggested, for the government of India not to secure from China a formal recognition of the India-China boundary in recognition of Chinese sovereignty over Tibet in 1954. Gopal thought otherwise. In his view, there seemed at the time no reason to insist on such an explicit assurance. The boundary between Kashmir and Xinjiang and Tibet was traditional, had been shown on official maps, Indian maps, and the Chinese, in his estimation, were obviously aware that this was regarded by India as a firm boundary. Similarly, in regard to the middle and the eastern sectors, there should have been no doubt, as in the middle sector, the 1954 agreement had specified as border passes, six passes that lay on the traditional watershed boundary. And in regard to the eastern sector, or the boundary between Arunachal Pradesh and Tibet, as far back as 20th November 1950, Nehru had stated in Parliament that the McMahon line is our boundary, map or no map. That fact remains and we stand by that boundary and we will not allow anybody to come across that boundary." Unquote. These were Nehru's words. As India saw it, the Chinese had raised no claim in regard to the Indian depictions of the boundary and far from doing so, as Gopal observed, had affirmed their respect for the territorial integrity of India. But the historian in Gopal also understood China's silence. Qing dynasty claims had been embraced by the new people's government of China. Gopal saw the People's Republic, and I quote, as intensely expansionist as any other in Chinese history. They only differed from their predecessors in bringing a new vigor 
to their policy and harnessing a new ideology in their service, unquote. When Nehru brought up the issue of an incorrect boundary alignment concerning India in Chinese maps with his Chinese hosts in October 1954 when he visited China, Premier Chun Lai said, these maps were of little significance, being reproductions of old maps and the people's government had had no time to revise them. Gopal's view was that at the heart of the failure to disclose Chinese claims on Indian claimed territory at this juncture was evidence of China's having, I quote, no desire for long-term friendship, unquote, with India. By 1959, with the unfolding of the revolt in Tibet, the flight of the Dalai Lama to India, and the proclamation of China's territorial claims in Premier Cho's letter to the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Nehru, of 23rd January 1959, the Rubicon had been crossed. Gopal defined it thus. To China, India was no longer a useful friend in the Afro-Asian world, but a rival. And in addition, relations with China were entangled with China's insecure position in Tibet and her differences with the Soviet Union." Unquote. The border clashes at Longju and the ambushing of an Indian police party at Konka Pass followed. In Jagat Mehta's words, Nehru was now caught between the outrage of Indian public opinion and serious damage to his hope that the India-China friendship would validate his confidence in different social systems coexisting peacefully. What had happened was that the high noon of those years of Indians and Chinese are brothers and the friendship of one billion, as the Chinese would often say, had been consigned to history. Dorothy Woodman, the journalist who subsequently went on to write the book Himalayan Frontiers, once remarked that Nehru died at the Konka Pass because after that time he realized that they, the Chinese, were not honest about the maps. These are her words. He knew about the road over the Aksai Chin. He had discussed the boundary question and the McMahon line with Cho Lai, and Cho Lai had really given Nehru to believe that they would accept the McMahon line. I think after the Konka Pass incident, Nehru began to mistrust the Chinese more and more and more. Then it seems to me Indian public opinion became hysterical about China, so that Nehru was himself under the pressure of public opinion, and then he was a very tired man. I do not think he was ever himself again, not completely. He was a very disillusioned man." Unquote. I agree with scholars like Prasenjit Dwara, who have said it would be unfair to castigate Nehru for a failure of statecraft. As part of his vision of exercising leadership in the Comity of Nations, Nehru had made the bringing of the PRC into an international arena dominated by the United States and the Western powers a central plank of his strategy. The tragedy was that this strategy was not destined to succeed. China's strategy, on the other hand, in the years after the Panchil Agreement of 1954, was to claim that it was acting on the basis of the five principles. Its refrain was to state that it was the victim of illegal and unequal treaties when it came to the definition of its lost territories. These lofty views rested on rather shaky foundations. Most of the Himalayan region, including Tibet, had been part of one vast buffer zone in the 19th and early 20th centuries. If China was seen as justified in acquiring a buffer in Tibet through an assertion of sovereignty, then India was equally acting within its rights when it moved after independence to consolidate its interests in the Himalayan buffer states of Nepal and Bhutan, ensuring that Sikkim was secure and consolidating its presence and sovereignty over areas like Tabang. And as Dwara notes, for India, the claim often heard from the Chinese that Nehru's government was appropriating the fruits of British imperialism seemed asymmetrical, considering that the Qing or Manchu Empire 
seen by the Chinese as proto-nationalist, was regarded by the Republican, the Chinese Republican revolutionaries in 1911 as alien and aggrandizing, read imperialist. It can be justifiably argued that Cho Enlai minimized the incipient territorial dispute with India, for it is conceivable that if the Chinese leader had spoken with greater transparency about Chinese claims in Ladakh during his talks with Nehru in 1956, at the height of a period of bilateral friendship and goodwill, and before the discovery of the Aksai Chin Road, and of course the happening of the revolt in Tibet, the trajectory of the dispute may have been different, and the scope for a negotiated settlement based on accommodation and adjustment by each side could have been more feasible. In retrospect, it is also clear that China misconstrued the depth of spontaneous reverence for the Dalai Lama in India. There was something peculiarly Indian, spiritual, and religious in the Indian reaction. In fact, besides sheltering the Dalai Lama and refugees from Tibet, credit must also be given to India for the special efforts initiated by Prime Minister Nehru to preserve the artifacts, treasures, manuscripts and paintings, all heirlooms of a Tibetan culture and civilization outside the Tibetan homeland. The dispatches of Appa Pant, our political officer in Sikkim during the 50s, describe how Nehru was reverentially called Chogyal and Dharma Raja by the Tibetans inside Tibet for his love and sentimental attachment to them and to their culture. They saw him as their protector. Nehru and Cho, two products of different revolutions involved in their respective definitions of nationhood, were key players in the determination of the course of the dispute. The decade and a half after India's independence had been the age of Nehru, particularly in Indian foreign policy. Nehru enjoyed an almost magical prestige with the Indian people. He was acclaimed as Bharat Bhushan, India's jewel. In, words of, in the words of one of his biographers, the Australian diplomat Walter Crocker, I quote, it was based in part upon the fact that the people believed he had been chosen by Gandhi as his political heir, in part upon the charm and aliveness of his mere presence, in part upon his devotion to the national interest as he saw it, so self-evident and so marking him off from the run of Indian politicians, unquote. Gopal, as Nehru's acclaimed biographer, charted the evolution of Nehru's personality over the years. Here again, Nehru's, here again, I'm just gonna lift this mic a little. May I lift it a little? Seems to be sinking into the paper. Gopal, as Nehru's acclaimed biographer, charted the evolution of Nehru's personality over the years. Here again, China is present as that familiar compound ghost. For as he evolved as a person and intellectual, Nehru discerned the common element in the struggles against imperialism of whatever shade in various parts of the world and awakened to a sympathy with China which was to be, for the rest of his life, the core of his pan-Asian feeling. As a young, emotional romantic, particularly, the frontiers of India's national movement for Nehru lay in Spain and in China, for freedom, like peace, was indivisible. And in the final analysis, it did not matter much where fate had pitched one's tent. This then was his formative ideology, maintaining through his life a half liberal, half Marxist position, experimenting with democratic socialism, a superhuman experiment in itself. During the mid 20th heyday of Indian foreign policy, Nehru succeeded admirably in creating a credible image of what Kingsley Martin once called, 
a third force, as if he could act as a peacemaker. This was particularly evident during the Korean War and in Indochina. To his international admirers, Martin being one of them, he seemed above all things to be a man struggling with immense difficulties and doing his best in impossible circumstances. Non-alignment was Nehru's diplomatic challenge, as some have called it, to the Cold War system. It was his attempt to remake the world of questioning assumptions about East and West, North and South. It was his way, as is said, of shoving back at international structures that shaped and shoved. He was ambitious about his foreign policy and India's role in the world, navigating between two opposing blocks, confronting issues of war and peace, and leaving an indelible global imprint in a way India has not been able to do since. But Nehru's view of the world was also based on a deep sense of morality. It stemmed from the zeitgeist, the Yuga Dharma of India's freedom movement, the record of having toppled, toppled the British Raj through nonviolent resistance. A recent work by Andrew Bingham Kennedy terms it as Nehru's imbued conviction of moral efficacy as opposed to confidence in the military sphere, an area where the contrast with China's early communist leadership is apparent. Kennedy's work compares Nehru not with Cho and Lai, but with Mao Zedong. In many ways, this is apposite, since Nehru was India's paramount leader in his heyday, in a way that Cho was not, because the latter constantly deferred to Mao. Cho is not known to have ever, ever questioned Mao's judgment, and it is assumed that all the decisions about the 1962 war with India emanated from Mao himself. Roderick McFarker notes how Mao always felt able to count on Cho's obedient acceptance of his directives, even when they went against the grain. In this, Cho was a contrast to Liu Shaoqi, who was willing to question Mao's judgment on some major issues, in many ways reminding one of Sardar Patel, although it must be stressed that Patel deferred to Nehru on questions of foreign policy. Where, in contrast to Nehru and his admiration of China, were the Chinese, especially their new leadership after 1949? When Sardar K. M. Panika, India's first ambassador to the People's Republic, arrived in Beijing in May 1950, the British Foreign Office had this to say, and this is from the British archives, I quote, it is worth keeping in mind that the Chinese on the whole have a profound contempt for the Indians and also a sense of very considerable superiority towards them. While the Indian on occasion may be sentimental, the Chinese is, is essentially a realist. On the personality side, while the Indians are frequently superior, the present Chinese communist leaders are physically and morally of an altogether tougher breed and fiber. Of the physical toughness of the Chinese communist, the long march is the classic heroic symbol. There is no doubt whatsoever that in the technique of political organization, hard-headedness and ruthless determination, and above all, in realism, the Chinese communists win hands down. This is a note dated 26th May, 1950. It follows that Nehru's main Chinese interlocutor, Cho Enlai, did not bring to the ambit of the Sino-Indian equation any special emotional attachment. Cho was adept in the ways of diplomacy. He adapted himself to different audiences, a study in ambivalence and seeming sincerity. At the Bandung conference, he was the talk of the town, the object of almost forensic attention widely seen as the shrewdest Asian diplomat of his time, according to the Western media, and even capable of manipulating his attire to suit different political audiences. Cho's biographer, Kao Wenqian, shows Cho as far from perfect 
often fallible, but with a deft talent for finding some tiny crack in the wall that would allow him to appear even keeled in his judgments. This is a quotation from Jonathan Spence, who was reviewing Kao Wenxun's book. Throughout, Cho was eternally deferent to Mao and forced to carry Mao's execution knife. Here was a man in whom Taoist-like concealment and endurance were combined with obedience and strategic defense. Both Nehru and Cho were men of great charm, tenacity, and intelligence, but Cho displayed ruthlessness and a cunning spawned on the battlefield of armed revolution. The veteran Indian journalist Frank Moraes, writing in 1963, had this to say about the Indian and Chinese mind, and the words, in my view, still carry meaning. And I'm going to quote this passage. Although the Indian mind is often convoluted and sometimes enigmatic, it lacks the curious combination of realism and, and elusiveness that distinguishes the Chinese mind. The Chinese mind is more nimble than the Indian's, gayer, less sensitive, but more practical. Without being fanciful, it likes to express itself in imagery and illustration, and the habit of building up an argument through suggestion rather than statement gives conversation with a cultivated Chinese a curiously evanescent, will-o'-the-wisp quality. It is like Huang Chuan, who painted in the boneless way, disdaining to imprison his landscapes, flowers, and birds within a drawn outline." Unquote. China's leadership, Mao Down, attributed their travails in Tibet post-1959 to India. This was a fundamental error in calculation. People's Liberation Army and official Chinese histories of the 1962 war see Nehru as a successor to British imperialist policy on Tibet, seeking to turn Tibet into a buffer zone. The argument is that India raised claims on Chinese territory as an adjunct to its avarice regarding Tibet. The line of argument propelled by Mao and which blamed Nehru for fomenting the revolt in Tibet was fully reflected in the People's Daily Broadside of 6th May 1959, entitled The Revolution in Tibet and Nehru's Philosophy. When the Soviet leadership and Khrushchev remonstrated that the troubles in Tibet, including the flight of the Dalai Lama, were the fault of China, this was roundly rejected by Mao. In his words, the Hindus acted in Tibet as if it belonged to them. Nehru had never at any stage sought independence for Tibet. In fact, he had in the early 50s conceded Chinese sovereignty over Tibet, only seeking respect in China for Tibetan autonomy, or as John Garver puts it, in terms of Tibet, Nehru hoped that China would repage India's friendship and consolidate the Sino-Indian partnership by granting Tibet a significant degree of autonomy. Early on, Nehru knew that there was not much any country, leave alone India, could do to prevent Chinese assertion of sovereignty over Tibet. However, it would have been impossible for Nehru, given the overriding sentiment of the Indian people, to have refused asylum to the Dalai Lama. Cho Lai, on his 1960 visit to India, maintained the Chinese perspective on Tibet. In a conversation with Ambassador R. K. Nehru on 21st April 1960, he attributed the differences and misunderstandings that had occurred between India and China to the revolt in Tibet and the coming of the Dalai Lama to India. He told Ambassador Nehru that the developments in Tibet had a direct bearing on the border problem. Cho went on to say, at the time of the Tibet revolt, India mentioned the Simla Convention of 1914 and asked us to accept the McMahon Line and also the 1842 Treaty, that's a treaty regarding Ladakh. We are not willing to accept either of them and we resent this new development." Unquote. While some attempts to dissect the causes of the conflict between India and China have famously sought to attribute culpability to India, I believe that the views expressed by the late K. Subramanian in 1970 
refuting such arguments are still very valid. When Cho and Lai spoke in Bandung of reasonableness and restraint in dealing with undetermined borders, the Aksai Chin Road was being constructed by Chinese crews. Indian patrols had accessed the Lanak La Pass in Ladakh in 1952 and 1954, and it was only in 1959 on their way to the same pass that our patrol was ambushed at Konka Pass. The Chinese claims in the Aksai Chin and Ladakh were being physically realized, even as Premier Cho spoke of restraint in the 50s and were completely consolidated with the conflict in 1962. Indian administration in the areas south of the McMahon Line was already a reality before 1947, except for Tawang, which was well south of the boundary claimed by India, but where administration was extended in 1951. Once the fact of contested territorial claims was in the open, when the cartographic claims and Chinese presence in the Aksai Chin became public knowledge in India, the national mood rallied around the need to protect national soil from what was seen as further Chinese ingress. The so-called forward policy was essentially aimed to block lines of further Chinese advance. The Chinese were crossing the Karakoram Divide into the basin of the Indus, threatening the heart of Ladakh. The definition of the Chinese claim in the Western sector was a shifting line from 1956 to 1962. This was what exacerbated the Indian concerns. It was assumed on the Indian side that these forward posts established would merely stop the Chinese advance and not provoke a Chinese attack. There were failures, no doubt, resting with India's decision-making, policy formulation, and military command and control concerning the events of 1962. Did Indian officialdom render less than their duty to their beloved Caesar, as a former Indian diplomat once said of how Nehru was served? Was there a general surrender to the hypnosis that Panditji knows best? Culpability, objectively put, must be shared, I believe, by both sides, India's and China's, for the train of events that transpired. And to heap reprobation on Nehru for our humiliation in 1962 does not do justice to the scale of his tremendous achievements in our foreign policy and national rejuvenation, or to the fact that while he saw the inevitability of China consolidating sovereignty over Tibet after 1949, he did put in place a definition of our frontier policy based on tradition, custom, geography, and history that was aimed at protecting rather than rendering vulnerable our sovereign territory. And he put India first. In retrospect, given the fact that the policy of setting up defensive posts in territory that India saw as its own was no declaration of war, was not intended to dislodge the Chinese from the Aksai Chin Road, but only aimed at defending against what was seen as a steadily advancing Chinese claim line, and the fact that the Chinese vacated territory they overran in Arunachal Pradesh, the 1962 attack by China seems in historical retrospect to have achieved little except to hugely damage trust and friendship with India. The lessons that history impart are that conflict is a zero sum and that rebuilding the relationship as a result from the ashes of 1962 has been an arduous process. For both countries, no amnesia is called for about 1962, only the need to learn from experience. Gopal would not have wanted any airbrushing of the history of what transpired in our relations with China before 1962. I'm sure that he would have been more than willing to subject his own role in the evolution of the dispute to objective scrutiny. I'm convinced he was serving a national cause as we would all have seen it in that formative era of, that, of the relationship. And his task was logically aimed at formulating a case for India that would be unimpeachable. <laughs> 
As Srinath Raghavan has noted, Gopal was not shy of revisiting his ideas and assumptions in the light of new information and developments. In the decades after the China War, his work in contemporary history, where he was a pioneer, saw him evolve into a public inter intellectual with a range of interests. He was one who felt deeply that the domain of ideas should be open to contestation. I believe he would have wanted that the history of the dispute and the war be examined so that we are able to extract value from it, value that will guide living and future generations of Indians. We must not, of course, be archivally challenged, as our NSA recently put it in this regard, and present and future generations of scholars must be able to access the records of that era in both countries in the interests of transparency. The intersection of historical research with policy making, which Gopal's work in the Ministry of External Affairs represented, was unique and not replicated since, and the ministry is the poorer for it. At the same time, let us recognize that Gopal made an excellent case for India on the boundary question with China, and that pending a border settlement, taking all the measures necessary to safeguard our interest, both on that high frontier and also in our China policy, is necessary and justifiable, even as we seek an avoidance of conflict. China came into our territory in 1962 and called it self-defense, another name for war. 50 years have not been enough to undo the damage of 1962. One can only hope that the next half century will yield more positive dividends for peace and reconciliation between these two Asian giants, two neighbors who critically define the future of Asia and bring a lasting, fair, and most importantly, a peaceful settlement of their bilateral differences on the boundary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Rao, for really filling in, uh, in such rich detail, this very important aspect of Gopal's life, his, his deep involvement in in the policy making uh, of, uh, of a critical part of India's foreign policy. And I think what you gave us was a really clear reconstruction of Indian perspectives and perceptions. And as your title is the politics of history, but I think what we also hear in, in your account is how, for better or worse, historical claims and the claims of the historian shaped India's politics with, with enormous consequences since. And, I think, as you say, understanding Gopal's own role is something we still need to figure out, and I hope some of our own PhD students or scholars might begin to think about that. But thank you once again. There won't be questions after the lecture, but there, are, there is a wine reception, and uh, you can, of course, speak informally uh, with Ambassador Rao uh, at, at the drinks reception and raise any questions you may like. Once again, thank you.